So that's the story about how a, an impulsive, unplanned decision actually is the reason why any of us are even talking about the This Is Paris documentary. Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Kristen. If you are new here, I make YouTube videos on Wednesdays. I made a re video recently about my experience coming out and how some people responded negatively. You can check that out on my channel. I also did a video last week about Stasi Schroeder and her attempt to rebrand after discussions of her racist behavior in the past have resurfaced and impacted her career. So if you're interested in hearing about either of those things, check out the other videos on my channel. Otherwise, stick around for this one today. So for today's video, I want to talk about Paris Hilton, her new documentary, and how a last minute decision helped her narrowly escape what I call the uncanny valley of authenticity. What is the uncanny valley of authenticity, you might ask? What decision did she make that helped her narrowly escape it? Stay tuned and I will answer those questions. But first, I need to give a little bit of background on Paris Hilton herself. Paris was born in 1981. In 1996, her family moved from Los Angeles to New York City, where her life changed pretty drastically. She went from being a little bit sheltered at home in LA to having access to the New York City social scene. Living in the city, a teenage Paris discovered the club scene and discovered that by lying about her age, she could go out and party pretty much whenever she wanted to. She gained notoriety in the tabloids for being a party girl because of her already famous name, Hilton, as well as her appearance in the club scene in New York City. As she was followed by photographers, stories about her were showing up in the New York City tabloids, and her parents failed to stop her from continuing to go out and party, they made a pretty drastic decision. They sent Paris to a series of what are called behavior modification schools. One of these behavior modification schools includes the infamous Provo Canyon School in Utah. We will talk a little bit more about her experience at these schools later. When she turned 18, she returned to New York City and returned to the social life that she had previously enjoyed, as well as the growing notoriety and or fame that came along with it. People were fascinated with this wealthy, young, beautiful, rich, seemingly real life Barbie doll. She began working with a manager to more intentionally curate her image and really leaned into this Barbie persona. At this point, it was in the early 2000s, she signed on to do the reality show, The Simple Life, which was based on the premise of placing two very wealthy, out of touch girls on a farm and essentially laughing at the hijinks that ensue. Have you ever had a real job? No. Okay. So Paris and Nicole Richie, her best friend at the time, went on the show and portrayed themselves as wildly out of touch, spoiled rich girls who thought you bought walls at Walmart and had never used a broom. I don't what know. What is Walmart? Mm. It's like they sell wall stuff. A few months before the debut of The Simple Life, her boyfriend from when she was 18 released what is objectively revenge porn. It was at the time referred to as a sex tape and treated like a porn film that she had intentionally made. This sex tape or revenge porn as i like to call it catapulted her to fame it turned her from being somebody well known in new york city to a household name so the sex tape revenge porn and the simple life served to solidify paris's public persona as the spoiled rich dumb blonde barbie girl she monetized this image for years, using it to build a veritable business empire. Right now, in 2020, she just released her 27th fragrance. She has many other branded product lines sold online and in 40 retail stores that are branded under her name throughout the world. She's also currently the highest paid DJ in the world. She has released multiple songs, all of which have pretty consistently landed on the Billboard charts. She even DJed at Tomorrowland, a 
very well-known music festival. All in all, Paris is estimated to have a net worth of 300 million, and the vast majority of this wealth is money that she made herself. In many people's eyes, she continues to be defined by this spoiled little rich girl, dumb blonde persona. A growing desire to have relatability, to recognize ourselves and the influencers that we support has made Paris's carefully curated caricature strategy a bit outdated. After years of acting as a character, of playing a role, Paris now sees the growing popularity of influencers who more or less get to be themselves. They get to be open about their struggles, their vulnerabilities, and they portray a certain level of authenticity. Not only can this form of fame feel more genuine and comfortable to the people who experience it, it also makes them a lot of money. Like I already pointed out, nowadays people want to be able to relate to the famous people that they follow. They want to feel like they have something in common with the influencers that they support. So it's no wonder that Paris might want to do something like that too. Even if playing the dumb blonde, the spoiled little rich girl, has been a key part of her success, it probably hasn't always been fun because she's received a lot of ire and derision for this persona that she's portrayed. Now that it makes sense monetarily, Paris has been trying to pivot and rebrand. Despite saying in interviews since 2014 that she was playing a character on The Simple Life and that that isn't really who she is, that she's in fact a pretty savvy businesswoman because you would have to be to get to the point that she got to in life, people don't really see her that way. Her public perception outside of her fan base has been widely unchanged since the early 2000s. So after years of working on a rebrand, of trying to get people to believe that she isn't that dumb blonde, she has set out to make a documentary that would be called This is Paris. This documentary was originally intended to display her business acumen and show the world that she is smart, actually. She was very open about this intention during interviews in the documentary. Had her documentary only really been about, actually, Paris is smart and she's a businesswoman, the documentary, I think, would have come across as just painfully transparent and maybe a little bit fake. And it would have fallen into what I call the uncanny valley of authenticity. So let's talk about what I mean by that. In the age of the influencer, people who want to monetize their image face the difficult task of needing to construct an exciting, enviable lifestyle while also maintaining a certain level of relatability and authenticity. They need to come across as being desirable, being interesting, but also not being out of touch. And so as I said earlier, this is because nowadays people want influencers to be real. They want to feel connected to the influencers that they support and they want to feel like these people are down to earth and like they have things in common with them. Part of the difficulty was striking this balance between having that perfect Instagram lifestyle and also coming across as authentic and relatable is that the second you start trying to be authentic as a marketing ploy, you render yourself supremely inauthentic. Trying to fake realness can make you come across as even more fake than had you just been open about being fake, if that makes any sense. This is where the uncanny valley comes in. So the uncanny valley is a concept that's used to explain why Pixar characters like the old man from Up are cute and characters like the conductor in the Polar Express are nightmare fuel. The idea here is that when something has some human features but is very obviously not human, such as an animated character in a Pixar movie, we find those things cute. 
our brains subconsciously recognize the human qualities and they like that. But when something is almost human, but not quite, our brains aren't subconsciously recognizing human qualities anymore. Our brains are recognizing instead a human that looks very off for some reason. You know, it's like something's wrong and you can't quite put your finger on it. That looking almost human but not quite human triggers alarm bells because it's just weird looking. It looks weird. I think that you can apply this concept to authenticity. When when a public figure does their job and they aren't trying to come across as authentic or relatable, we like that. We like that fine. That's kind of the equivalent of the Pixar character. It doesn't set off any alarm bells because they're not trying to fake anything. We don't, we're not under any illusions that they're being their authentic selves. An example of a celebrity who is just kind of playing their role and not necessarily trying to be authentic would be Paris Hilton on The Simple Life. It didn't set off any alarm bells in our head because she wasn't coming across like like she was trying so hard to make us like her. Like she really wanted us to think she seemed normal. She came across like we expected her to. She came across like a spoiled rich party girl, which is the role that she had already been embodying in the public's mind before. So it doesn't set off any red flags when somebody is just doing their job and not trying to come across as genuine. Now, another thing that doesn't raise any red flags is when a person is actually being genuine. So think about, say, Jennifer Lawrence when she was first getting famous and doing press tours. People thought she seemed so down to earth and so normal and so cool because she seemed very down to earth, normal and cool. She didn't seem like she was putting on an act at all. Now, the uncanny valley of authenticity falls somewhere between these two categories of not trying to come across as real at all and seeming very genuinely authentic. The uncanny valley is when you are trying to seem authentic, but we can tell or we feel like we feel like you're faking it. And so the uncanny valley of authenticity is a place that I believe Paris would have landed had her documentary gone through as planned, had it only been about her business empire and how she's smart and a businesswoman. I think that would have been a very transparent attempt at a rebrand and I, I don't really think people would have responded to it. I think some people would have been interested, but I think the wider public would have either paid no attention to it or would have thought it was funny that she was trying to be relatable and come across as down to earth. So I've said over and over that Paris avoided falling into the uncanny valley of authenticity by not following through with the original plan for the documentary. So what do I mean by that? What did she do that took her so off course from the plan that she ended up actually coming across as very authentic? Well, essentially, she avoided the uncanny valley by just actually being authentic. Throughout the creation of this documentary, Paris became close with the director and opened up to the director about traumatic experiences she had as a teenager. She told the director about these behavior modification schools that I mentioned that her parents sent her to. Students who have come out of these schools, in addition to Paris, have reported abuse. It has been reported that students experience solitary confinement, verbal abuse, over medication, and physical abuse. Paris has made very similar statements about her experiences at the school. So that's really dark and really troubling and obviously very traumatic for a teenager to experience for years of her life. Once she had told the director about these experiences, the director convinced her that she should talk about them in the documentary and that she should cover this in the documentary. And I think that was a really good decision. To talk about her trauma to such a large audience required something that is very difficult to fake, vulnerability. No PR team can help you strategize and figure out a way to be open, vulnerable, and earnest. That is something that you either do or you don't do. But it's something that 
has to come from a real place. By being vulnerable, Paris delivered a level of authenticity that's difficult to dispute. This element of vulnerability elevated her documentary from being a kind of boring puff piece about how smart she is actually to being a very compelling story about trauma and the ways that we respond to it. In Paris's case, she responded by working her butt off for years. This prevented the documentary from being a transparent attempt at saying, I'm really normal, y'all. And it helped her stay out of the uncanny valley of authenticity. This is because being vulnerable is one of the fastest ways to form a connection with anyone. And doing so in front of a large audience like that is a way to form a connection with pretty much everyone who watches the documentary, which as I think I've stated, gives this sense of authenticity to the documentary. So what does it all mean? What are like the conclusions that you can draw from, from this story? Well, for me, one takeaway is that because of this kind of unplanned choice to be vulnerable and open in her This Is Paris documentary, Paris Hilton may actually achieve the rebrand that she has been seeking since at least 2014, like I mentioned. Even though her original plan was to create the documentary to show that she's a smart businesswoman, by allowing the documentary to focus on other aspects of her life, she made the documentary compelling and powerful and made the information about her businesswoman side kind of interesting. Whereas if that had been the only thing in the documentary, I don't think it would have been that interesting. So Paris's show of vulnerability has given her an air of authenticity that will hopefully give her the rebrand that she's been seeking for years. That's, that's great for her. What is my takeaway? What should our takeaways be? Well, while Paris's vulnerability and earnestness seemed very genuine and seemed to come from a very real place, in many cases, things that we perceive as authenticity or being genuine or real or relatable are actually very calculated decisions being made by influencers. It's important to remember that in 2020, we've commodified authenticity and monetized it. So every influencer that you look up to and support is incentivized to pretend like they're being realistic and genuine and down to earth and authentic with you. Among the fleeting examples of true authenticity are endless examples of people portraying authenticity and trying to feign being down to earth and real. It's strategic authenticity. Many of the influencers we love for being real may just be good actors. So that's not to say you shouldn't still follow and support the influencers and celebrities that you like that you perceive as being genuine and authentic, but you should take their displays of authenticity with a grain of salt because there's monetary incentive to seeming authentic. It's just important to be aware that influencers are incentivized to come across as genuine and real. It's possible and likely that many of the people we consider to be down to earth and authentic and genuine actually are, but we need to remember and consider the motivations of people when we follow them and when we listen to their opinion. Because if we don't stay aware of their motivations and what drives them, then we might find ourselves falling prey to people who are being super fake with us. So that's the story about how a, an impulsive, unplanned decision actually is the reason why any of us are even talking about the This Is Paris documentary. That's the video. Thank you if you got to this point. I really appreciate everybody who supports me. I would really appreciate if you would like this video and comment. It helps the algorithm know that people are interested in my videos. I am, I make videos every Wednesday. I will be back next Wednesday with a new video and yeah. Thank you. Have a nice day.